welcome everybody. And I think I'll, I'll make a start. I'm chairing today's session, which is our keynote speaker, Professor Caroline Rooney. My name is Nicola Pratt. I'm the outgoing Vice President of Brismas. Um, and I'm going to, so I'm going to be chairing today's session. I'm going to start by introducing Professor Rooney. Um, she's a professor of African and Middle Eastern studies at the University of Kent. She's, she was born in Zimbabwe and studied at the University of Cape Town before taking up a Bate Fellowship to undertake doctoral research at the University of Oxford. She works and publishes mainly in the areas of post-colonial studies and Arab cultural studies, focusing on the cultural expression of liberation struggles and their aftermaths in sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa and the Middle East. She is the author of African Literature, Animism and Politics, um, published in 2000, Decolonizing Gender, Literature and the Poetics of the Real, published in 2007, and her most recent book is called Creative Radicalism in the Middle East, Culture and the Arab Left After the Uprisings. And this book is currently on sale um, at the Bloomsbury um, uh, virtual platform as part of the conference with a 35% discount for uh, conference attendees. So fantastic opportunity to get hold of this book. Um, then also uh, Professor Rooney's co-edited a number of other uh, important publications, including Egyptian Literary Culture and Egyptian Modernity uh, in the Journal of Postcolonial Writing and the Ethics of Representation in Literature, Art and Journalism, Transnational Responses to the Siege of Beirut. Her research by practice includes theatre productions and documentary films. From 2009 until 2012, she was a Global Uncertainties Fellow with a programme entitled Radical Distrust, a Cultural Analysis of the Emotional, Psychological and Linguistic Formations of Political and Religious Extremism. And between 2012 and 2015, she held a uh, PACCS Leadership Fellowship with a program entitled Imagining the Common Ground, Utopian Thinking and the Overcoming of Resentment and Distrust. Uh, she's been the UK-based pr principal investigator of a project called Egypt's Living Heritage that uh, was funded by uh, Newton in 2016. And currently, She's the co-investigator of a project called the Crime Terror Nexus from Below, Criminal and Extremist Practices, Networks and Narratives in Deprived Neighbourhoods of Tripoli, funded by the ESRC. So it's a real pleasure and honour to have Professor Rooney as our keynote speaker for today uh, at the Brisbane Conference, our opening day. And, um, and I think her body of work in general uh, really speaks to the themes of the conference, uh, power and knowledge in Middle Eastern studies. Um, her talk today is uh, extremely timely given the culture wars that are raging uh, in Europe, uh, the UK and North America. Um, the title of her talk today is called The Revolution is a Woman from Woke Culture to the Arab Awakening. Um, the presentation will begin with a consideration of the manifesto launched last year by French scholars that, uh, said that um, accused um, woke culture of being responsible for extremist terror and post-colonial studies as responsible for this in its promotion of identity politics. And Caroline will go on to uh, explore um, the difference between extremism and revolutionary radicalism arguing that these are different formations um, and uh, in doing so she'll uh, draw upon um, examples from the Arab uprisings, particularly with respect to how women were at the forefront of the uprisings under the slogan of the revolution is a woman. So without further ado, 
I'm going to hand over to Professor Rooney, who will speak for around 50 minutes. Following this, there will be um, ample time then for questions from the audience. So please do think about what questions you would like to ask Professor Rooney um, after her talk. Um, I'm sure she'll look forward to hearing your responses uh, and it will help us to all feel a bit more connected in this sort of um, strange virtual experience that we're having. Okay, so over to you, Professor Rooney. Thank you so much, um, Nicola, um, for that kind introduction. And also thank you to you and team for putting together such a great conference. Um, so I'm delighted to be able to join you today. Uh, I'm going to begin by trying to share my screen. Um, is it up there? Yes. Great. Okay, so um, yeah, um, as indicated in the first part of this presentation, I will address the recent French critique of American work culture before going on to consider certain significant differences between this work culture and what I'm calling the Arab awakening um, in terms of how it's, the, this culture has been characterized. Um, so the Arab awakening, it's, it's a phrase that Tariq Ramadan earlier applied to the Arab Spring in 2012, while the designation goes yet further back to George's Antonius's book on Arab nationalism. Um, so at this outset, I should explain that only towards the end of my talk will I come to specifically address the Arab revolutionary slogan, um, the revolution is a woman that was used particularly in the <clears throat> Lebanese uprisings from 2019 onwards, while also echoing other formulations of the various Arab uprisings. The recent French critique of identity politics that I refer to took shape in November of last year, when a letter appeared in Le Monde on the 2nd of November, signed by 100 French academics, writing in the wake of the beheading of teacher Samuel Paty for his recirculation of the Muslim taunting um, Charlie Hebdo cartoons amongst his students. The signatories of the letter wrote to express their view that what the French call Islamo-Gauchism, Islamic leftism, is attributable to American style woke politics and to post-colonial studies. The argument of these intellectuals is this kind of identity politics serves destructively to undermine the humanist universality that French republicanism stands for. Well, the difficulty with manifestos is that by their nature, they tend to be one-sided, whereas I have both disagreements and agreements with the French position put forward, as well as agreements and disagreements with certain responses to it. Regarding the latter, the Le Monde letter served to generate a reply signed by, by about 500 American and other Anglophone intellectuals um, that appeared in open democracy a few days after the French manifesto. The response of these academics is that, of course, they are not racists at all, um, but anti-racist, and that the attempt to silence their voices can be attributed to right-wing authoritarianism, a question that I will return to. The French group wrote back, um, in turn, to clarify their position, saying that for them, it is not a left or right division that's at stake. And they explain, rather, it is between those on one side who trust in universalism and believe that the bonds of a nation, if not a civilization, are primarily expressed through its shared values, and those on the other side who view society as a collection of antagonistic groups, as based on identities that determine all power-driven relations. Well, this debate has not only been amongst French intellectuals, but has been encouraged by the French higher education minister, Frédéric Vidal, worried about the spread of so-called Islamic leftism in educational institutions in particular, and this accompanied by Macron's critique of Islamic separatism. It's been quite a big debate in France. However, it is a debate that, as maintained, um, does actually cut across the right and the left. Um, in France. So Elisabeth Rudinesco, a French historian of ideas who is on the left, a few months ago published a book entitled Soi-même comme un roi, oneself as a king, 
um, that offers a critique of um, identity politics as a matter of would-be leftists going astray. In brief, Rudinesco's argument is that identity politics tends to encourage a focus on the self, including group self, at the expense of the more revolutionary politics of socio-political and economic causes of earlier periods, including anti-colonial liberation movements that she goes into. Um, so I would like to contribute to this argument as I'll explain further, but I'll first address some of the questions raised by the French manifestos. To begin with, it has to be said that the understanding of post-colonial studies put forward by the French intellectuals concerned is a rather inaccurate one. The French academics maintain that post-colonial studies began in America over guilt about the slave trade. They accuse post-colonial studies of being ahistorical in failing to acknowledge that they were also African and Arab slave traders and further accuse post-colonial studies of mere self-righteous political posturing without true disciplinary, methodological and epistemic grounding. However, for a start, the need of clarification is that post-colonial studies did not actually begin in America. The discipline emerged as a discipline in British universities at the start of the 60s, Kent, where we are virtually now, being one of these universities. It emerged through academics, often from or with links to British colonies, attempting to engage with anti-colonial and decolonial liberation movements. It was similar, therefore, to how certain French intellectuals, such as Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Memmi, supported the liberation of French North Africa. In Britain, the emphasis was on the liberation literature being produced by African, Indian and Caribbean writers. And this was in tandem with publishing houses finding a market for what was initially and variously called Commonwealth literature, third world literature, new literatures and English, becoming eventually post-colonial studies. The French confusion over post-colonial studies is due, I believe, to how post-colonial theory as distinct from post-colonial studies was set up as a field, particularly through an influential study produced by Robert Young um, entitled White Mythologies, published in 1990. Um, okay, um, so at the time, Young was much involved in the dissemination of French post-structuralist theory in a British context, where the objection to post-structuralism, especially on the part of cultural and historical materialists, was that it was too ahistorical and apolitical. What Robert Young does in his book to counter such objections is to show how Edward Said, Gayatri Spivak and Homi Baba all draw on French post-structuralism in confronting colonial pasts. The difference here between post-colonial studies and post-colonial theory is that Said, Spivak and Baba are immigrants that had first come to the West to study Western thought and culture. So they were studying Western thought and culture as is distinct from studying the work of the colonized, the latter being the focus of British post-colonial studies. Thus, Said's do doctorate was on Conrad rather than, for instance, on Canafani, and Spivak's entry into the fairy world was through her translation of Derrida's of grammatology while her doctorate was on Yeats. The irony as far as the French case against identity politics is concerned is that post-colonial theory installed itself in America through Indian and Arab intellectuals taking up the thought of French post-structuralists. Spivak being a follower of Derrida, Said being much influenced by Foucault and Baba by Lacan. So is it possible that the seeds of identity politics in some way lie in post-structuralist thought or in how it is transported to an Anglo-American context. Of note, I think, is that French post-structuralism broke with the previous Marxist revolutionary generation, one much associated with Sartre and the Algerian liberation struggle. Foucault explicitly speaks of the age of revolution being over, that's a quotation, and his fascination um, with the construction of marginal identities has certainly been an influence on American identity politics, especially in the area of queer theory, as well as on Said's formulation of Orientalism as a kind of colonial identity politics. That said, Said is not, of course, an advocate of Orientalist politics, but rather tries to dismantle such. In fact, in Culture and Imperialism, he says that the labels of identity politics are mystifications that in the light of experience are, quote, 
quickly left behind. In addition, it's worth noting that the French post-structuralist position tended to be that identities are formed by social texts constructed outside of us that, as argued by Althusser, people are interpolated or hailed into. Um, a position that influenced the um, American um, thinkers of identity politics in the early days and so in the 80s and also beyond, um, perhaps extending to this day, I think. Um, so while my argument is that identity politics may be seen to arise as a potentially a swerve away from the discourse around liberation movements and, and as an abandonment of revolutions in Foucault's terms, um, of particular relevance is the emergence of a certain American resistance to what was dubbed New French Feminisms and the anthology of translated writings of that name that appeared in America in um, 1980. Yes, yeah, so I've had a chance to go back and, and look at these writings again. Um, the feminist writings in question, they grew out of the spirit of the May 68 revolution, as several of the writers in the anthology attest to. Um, as such, the movement combines anti-capitalist positions with anti-phallocentric and anti-patriarchal ones. The French feminist writings are anarchically diverse in resisting the way that women have been conditioned to accept patriarchally defined identities. A nascent feminist editorial collective state that what they wish to destroy is the generic, saying at the same time as we destroy the idea of generic woman, we also destroy the idea of the generic man. The position was that generic thinking creates stereotypes where identities are categories, while at the same time, the critique of generic postulations does not mean that real women do not exist, so much as that they are irreducible to ideologically conditioned templates. In fact, this is a, an argument that Said has put forward about Orientalism, that to critique the Orientalist stereotype does not mean in his view that uh, actual Arab people and um, cultures don't exist. In accordance with the previous, a common demand of new French feminism is that women should write out of their own experiences as women to overcome the alienation and systems of representation that fail to convey their own sense of reality. Writer Marguerite Dura comments, one scarcely has the time to experience an event as important as May 68 before men begin to speak out, to formulate theoretical epilogues. They immediately forced women revolutionaries as well as other revolutionaries to keep silent. New French feminism thus particularly became known for its retrieval of women's voices, particularly through a mode of writing named écriture féminine that allowed women to express creatively their own sense of their femininity as well as feminine perspectives of the world. While the movement presents itself as concerned with this retrieval of femininity, this is notably not just for women, um, but ultimately they say for the sake of humanity. For example, Suzanne Horror and Jean Soquet explain, we think it is a bad mistake for women to pursue deliberately the puppet's tinsel and formulae worn out by men. We think that women must uh, offer other forms of social systems, other forms of creation, other goals, other directions, and be other, we mean better, we mean those that stress the value of human beings as a whole that truly liberate them. So quite a, a utopian vision of feminism. And this utopian vision of feminism for the revolutionizing of human society was predominantly met with quite a lot of suspicion in America at the time. Sylvie Gambaudo argues that the French emphasis on the maternal and feminine disconcerted American feminists. And she comments, some Anglo-American feminists who after a long battle had earned social, political and academic credence suddenly found their secure base vulnerable to theories of difference. So her point is that um, Anglo-American women had been trying to raise their status and equate themselves with men as not different from them through equality. And now they were being faced with this celebratory approach to sexual difference. Um, well, the main American objection to the French feminist movement was that it constituted a form of biological essentialism, 
For example, Anne Rosalind Jones objects that French feminists believe in a bedrock female nature. However, the accusation of biological essentialism is a bit of a polemical distortion of what many of the French writers are actually saying. In fact, there are numerous places in which they contest the concept of biological essentialism. And their emphasis is rather on how women have had their voices and thus their subjectivities and psychologies suppressed much more than it is on this question of what they see as the mute biological body. Um, thus, Simone de Beauvoir asserts that women seek to reflect their own values and are thereby inventing a form of speech, as she says, to express the, the specificity. So she puts the emphasis on this inventing a form of speech, which I think largely characterizes what they were trying to do. Um, in addition to the previous, a number of the French writers um, challenged the notion of the purely feminine, as I think is also worth mentioning. Um, they address things like um, androgyny and psychic bisexuality and so on, as is, of course, not a case of biological essentialism. And, and, the, and this androgyny that they speak of is not the same as intersex as such. Um, so, um, yeah, it is my argument that aspects of American identity politics, politics um, emerged in tandem with a kind of resistance to French feminism that was um, strategically dismissed as essentialist, um, where the American investment was much more in gender as a constructed and performed identity as opposed to being a lived and living reality. Um, and in fact, this post-structuralist position has long been contested. For instance, um, Naomi Klein in uh, No Logo um, argues like Rudinesco that the um, investment and progress through identity promotion um, had, was in danger of leading to an abandonment of the radical socio-political causes. And in fact, as far back as 1990 in No Logo, um, Klein presents a critique of um, identity politics as feeding into um, the capitalism of brands and branding, brands as identities, as she shows, and identities as potentially being used as similar to, to brands. Um, okay, so what I want to say is that while the notion of woke first arose through the civil rights movement, um, I think that, that um, when it first um, arose, it had, um, you know, strong similarities with uh, the kinds of things that we find in the Arab awakening, a kind of revolutionary consciousness. But the question is the extent to which um, some of this has been subsequently commodified, um, at least to some extent, um, through a kind of appropriation on the part of certain strands of identity politics. Um, and in a way, um, the problem here is that the commodification of what was first African-American work culture um, can have the effect of neutralizing it um, at the same time that the appropriation of wokeness um, arguably um, aims to accord an aura of authenticity to um, what is otherwise commodified, which is in fact um, an argument that Klein makes. So it can actually also add a kind of aura of authenticity to the commodification of identities. In an interview with Brenna Bandha and Rafif Siada that appeared last year, revolutionary feminist Himani Banerjee in a critique of the limitations of identity politics states, anti-racist feminists demanded a fundamental socio-political change, not one that could be accomplished by a designatory list of cultural categories. She continues, this official multiculturalism is deeply connected to the idea of equity rather than social justice. Um, so perhaps here what she's pointing to is that equality as equity can depend on a logic of equivalence and exchange value as accords with commodification under capitalism. Um, okay, so one, one further thing that may be noted is that the rejection of the French interest in femininity um, happened to coincide <clears throat> with the rise of queer theory. And in queer theory, there were certainly um, some feminists who identified with um, strongly with masculinity. And so the French um, emphasis um, 
on femininity, you know, became something that um, became, I think, quite challenging. Um, so, okay, so I've, I've raised the whole question of this marginalization of radical French feminism in that I do think it has some bearing on the Arab Spring, um, so-called, or the Arab uprisings, while the latter, um, as we'll see, shifts the emphasis to the revolution itself as feminism, as feminist and feminine. Um, so while the French case for universality seems to allow for sexual differences in terms of its May 68 legacy, there's a certain blind spot in the French manifesto position regarding the differences between revolutionary radicalism and Islamist extremism. Although Islamist terrorism is extremist, this is not the same as the creative radicalism of liberation movements and revolutions. This difference is one of the things that I explore at length in my book, Creative Radicalism in the Middle East. In using the term Islamo-leftism, the subterfuge of certain French academics appears to be to equate the left with Islamic extremism, to discredit the left in an avoidance of how the true left is much more aligned with the revolutionary tradition of the Arab uprisings that is in keeping with earlier liberation movements. So the attempt to equate left-wing radicalism with terrorist extremism is actually one that emerged in the 1980s. And um, I would pay particular reference here to Benjamin Netanyahu's book, Terrorism, How the West Can Win. And in this book, Netanyahu calls for a war on terror quite explicitly. And this, this was prior to 9-11, of course. Um, in brief, Netanyahu and his colleagues equate all liberation struggles, including those of the ANC and IRA and others, with terrorism in order to disqualify the Palestinian struggle as a liberation movement. Um, it is seen by them as merely a terrorist movement. While I am sympathetic to the French and other calls for universality, as I'll say more about, I do not think that trying to foreclose the revolutionary left through equating it with extremism as the enemy can be considered the basis for true universal, universalism as they claim to be interested in. Um, in fact, historically, radical liberation movements struggle for a wider universality than allowed for by their oppressors. Many people could be quoted here from Martin Luther King to Angela Davis. So there is this question always on the side of the left around this question of a wider universality. Um, yeah, philosophically speaking, the neoliberal extremist opposition is actually one that I call a doppelganger formation, a, a Jekyll and Hyde conundrum, as I could explain um, more about later if desired. Um, okay, so one of the difficulties, obviously, that the French intervention serves to raise is that much of the critique of identity politics, especially in America, comes from the right and far right that ascribe to themselves a standardized and homogenous universality of what is actually a particular identity marketed as the majority. And it is this that understandably leads to the defense of excluded minorities. However, the problem I'm drawing attention to is that the left is then faced with this accumulation of minorities. Um, and then the, the task remains one of retrieving the meaning of universality from the appropriations of the right. I am saying that I think the right use identity politics to appropriate um, the meaning of universality and, and that it's worth confronting this. Um, so at this point, I'd like to turn to the arguments put forward by Mahmoud Mamdani in his recent book, Neither Settler Nor Native. In the study, Mamdani explores how settler colonialism works through the politicization of identities in order to produce a majority national identity that it seeks to make permanent, a set up against minority identities that could be said to exist in a permanently precarious state. Mamdani is particularly concerned with the relationship between settler colonialism and genocide. And so he says that he wishes to concentrate his study on the case studies of America, South Africa, and Israel. 
Mamdani believes that America has repressed and erased any consciousness of itself as a settler colony, something that Mamdani considers remains the case today. America was, of course, founded on the genocidal usurpation of Native American built through the labor of the slave trade from Mamdani, whereas African Americans have been, in his view, more or less integrated into the nation state as such, Native Americans have not. He argues that Native Americans have been tribalized and partitioned off into reserves, similar to South Africa's creation of Bantustans. The dividing of the Native population to separate ethnic, tribal, and religious groups in his general argument thus turns what is actually often an original Native majority into a collection of fragmented minorities. Mamdani calls this overall strategy define and rule, obviously an adaptation of divide and rule. Mamdani's work could be considered to have similarities with Said's understanding of Orientalism as a classificatory system in the service of power. However, I think it points to a potentially different consideration of colonialism. While Said tends to the obsessive othering of the other on the part of Europeans, Mamdani's interest in the genocidal side of colonialism points converse, conversely to a refusal to recognize and acknowledge the other out of a will to erase the other. In Orientalism, there is at least a self-other relation while with genocide, there's absolutely not a self-other relation. Um, Okay, so in Creative Radicalism in the Middle East, I query Edward Said's assertion that German Orientalism is more benign than British and French Orientalism. For Said, the German interest in the Orient was more of an intellectual phenomenon than an operation of power, because Germany was much less of an imperial and colonial actor than Britain or France. However, in my view, German Orientalism can be seen in a way to pave the path for German nationalist genocide of the Jews, even if, of course, unintentionally so. The formation of German nationalism can be seen to be in tandem with the German fascination with Oriental religions, um, as is very notable um, in Hegel, Nietzsche, and Heidegger. In brief, my argument is that the German national self was produced through the internalization of the Oriental other. This other was turned into the German self um, in subtle and complex ways. Thus the paradoxical essence of Nazi Germany was the production of itself as an Aryan or Orientalized nation. So what I'm trying to draw attention to is a certain ruse whereby the other is internalized and turned into self. Um, whereby the external or real other is to be disposed of and erased, producing the genocidal drive. So my theory is that as the Germans orientalize themselves, incorporating the Orient into their self-image, securing that this identity was in tandem with the would-be erasure um, of the Jews seen as non-Western peoples from Eastern heritages. In fact, there were a lot of paintings depicting um, the, the, the Jews in these um, terms as a recent exhibition has shown. Um, coming back to Mamdani's arguments, I would add to them that genocidal colonial racism concerns how the settler immigrant tries to usurp the native through internalizing the native while trying to make the actual native disappear. White pride Americans can be seen to enjoy posturing as shamans from the Ku Klux Klan wizard man to the recent Capitol Hill shaman, while the actual shamans are Native Americans. Joseph Pierce writes of the Capitol Hill shaman, white supremacists like Angeli pose as Indians in order to create an image of themselves as inseparable from the land itself. They imitate indigenous people and they justify their actions by imagining themselves as the natural heirs to a land retroactively emptied of Native Americans. Pierce as a Cherokee Nation citizen further comments, it is a desire for indigeneity without indigenous people. Again, it is a case of wanting the otherness of the other for the self without the actual other. What accompanies this structure is a paranoid fear amongst white supremacists, 
the outsiders stand to rob them of the native authenticity they themselves have appropriated or privatized as their own in the first place. So there's this fear that their, their native authenticity is to be taken away from them. Israel's position is in some demonstrable respect, similar to this far right American supremacist one. The recent provocations of Palestinians by Israel have notably served to unleash criticism of the Israeli state by some of its leftist Israeli citizens. One such Israeli citizen wrote a letter stating, today I'm saying enough is enough. You can't expel families from their homes with nowhere else to go and no means to survive and expect them not to resist. We call them barbarians. We give them the dirty jobs we won't do. We limit their freedoms, but on the same note, we love eating their hummus and kanafe. Um, we love to go sleep in their tents. We love to listen to their music. Why don't we love them? The anonymous writer of the letter had a friend post it um, on social media for fear of reprisals. The writer clearly shows how the Israeli state seeks to internalize the Arab cultural other in establishing the nativized Israeli while denying the actual other. The dissident Israeli writer also states, they, the Palestinians, have no leaders they can trust. We literally created Hamas, so that way the PA would have an enemy and it will be easier to divide and conquer them. Well, certainly Israel widely practices forms of demographic and ideological divide and rule which is why the regained unity of the recent Palestinian resistance has been considered so significant. Um, okay, so many have argued that racist extremism is a psychopathology from Octave Manoni to Fanon to recently Stephen Frosch. Um, and um, what Frosch ident identifies as a kind of appropriative envy of the other that is um, bound up with a desire to er eradicate the other that I've just been addressing as a kind of colonial genocidal formation. And I think that psychoanalytic understandings of this formation, including also of its potentially traumatic foundations and certainly of its traumatic effects, um, uh, need to be understood. And I think this is one needed approach to decolonization that is certainly being taken up. I'm thinking of Lenny Auerstadt or Robert Bashar's work on decolonial psychoanalysis. Beyond this, the political approaches to decolonization assume, broadly speaking, two different trajectories, one being the assimilation of so-called minority groups into Western democratic maternity, while the alternative political tra trajectory to this offers a radical contestation of enlightenment legacies as entailing an economy of universality that forecloses and repeatedly turns away from revolutionary experiments that serve to create alternative formations of universality, ones that may be said precisely to resist the foreclosures of non-capitalist forms of coexistence. So I would now finally like to turn to the Arab uprisings um, in terms of some of their differences from identity politics. I will begin with the writer Yassin Al-Hajj Saleh's recent reflections on the Syrian revolution after a decade um, of struggle. Um, he remarks that, I think that we are witnessing the replacement of the idea of a demos citizenry with that of a genus, race or kin. And he further soberingly states, I believe that the main political evil and logical endpoint of this era is genocide, something that prioritizing the war on terror conceals, facilitates even, especially against Muslims. Thus, this perspective is that we remain in the colonial genocidal formation that Mamdani addresses in terms of the politicization of identities. Ahaj maintains that the Syrian state tolerates sex very well, but not revolutionaries. Whereas I'll come to argue, revolutionaries are, are not concerned actually with sex or, or even the politicization of identities. Regarding Western intellectuals, Ahal Haj Saleh explains, many are eager to instruct you how to 
think even about your own country, basing the ideas not on real knowledge, um, but um, instead of paradigms that they have already prepared. Um, okay, so he explains that what for the West, as well as for Arab despots, is positioned merely as terrorism or extremism has numerous different contexts in the Middle East. And I think this is true. Um, for instance, in a context where the political sphere is monopolized by hereditary elites, um, and the state is virtually privatized, the people thus without access to a political community are often allowed only um, their religious spheres of operation. Um, so Ahar Saleh speaks of Syria, but this is true of jihadist groups in Tripoli's Lebanon too, as I've been co-researching with Raphael Lefebvre. I mean, Raphael's done a lot of work in this area and it's truly illuminating. He has a forthcoming book that will make people question the assumptions they have about um, jihadi groups. Um, finally, um, Alhaj Saleh comments significantly, we the people of this region are also a religious proletariat, something that has the potential of revolutionizing our thought and culture, hopefully breaking with identity politics. Um, so this is the position that I'm sort of interested in exploring that a revolutionary consciousness constitutes a potential break with identity politics. Is, is this possible and if so, how? Um, the first question I wish to address here concerns forms of solidarity. Mamdani argues that what brought apartheid to an end is when certain people of the settler middle class allied in common purpose with African liberation fighters. Um, and I'd say that this is an accurate assessment um, of what for me was um, a lived reality of how things happened in Southern Africa. For instance, I participated in groups that involved middle class and working class people working together across class lines, gender lines, and um, racial divides. Um, and this was against the, the colonial state um, that was really quite obsessed with the political promotion of race consciousness. That's what we had all the time. And we were trying to work against this. Um, Mamdani observes white fear did not carry the day. Why? Because important sections of the liberation movement had learned to think in holistic terms. The struggle was not against settlers, but settler power. So he says that the movement was away from the politicization of identities to rather concentrating on the structures of power in society. Of course, you can't entirely separate the two, but it was the kind of structural approach that he's emphasizing. Uh, Mandani, Right, um, South Africans have thus failed one pillar of the settler versus native distinction in their country, race as political identity. He's not against identities, but the politicization of identity. And he says, this is the key divergence from the US situation. However, Mamdani leaves it completely open as to what ensues from this. Um, and I think therefore more could be said um, about what is at stake or, or what it means to simply dissolve the distinction between settler and native. Um, okay, a second related point I want to make here concerns how liberation struggles entail forms of consciousness that don't necessarily accord with the opposed idealist and materialist paradigms of Western thought. Um, in coming to work on anti-colonial liberation struggles myself, um, I realized that the epistemic frameworks I was being taught in the Western context were not really proving um, that fit for purpose. Um, on the one hand, um, I was being introduced to French post-structuralist theory and with its anti-revolutionary stance and its textual idealism, in the words of Benita Parry, it was not really um, an adequate approach. While um, post-structuralism was mainly resigned to capitalist inevitability, it always tended to posit the always already scripted, that you could only deconstruct um, as opposed to the question of creating uh, new scripts um, in ways that might be spontaneous and experimental. 
um, so for me, the whole kind of emphasis of perform on performativity within post-structuralism always begged the question for me of, of creativity, because performativity was based on what was always already scripted. What, what about creativity? Um, on the other hand, Marxist materialism could not account for the liberation movement due to, as Sally asserts of Syria, the proletariat being religious in that kind of context. The epistemic alternative I found was to read the Southern African struggles I was initially looking at in terms of the animist holistic philosophies that often inspired them or otherwise tallied with them in certain ways. And um, so in the context of the Arab uprisings, I was actually first invited to participate in intellectual life in Egypt um, through my work on animism and with others had begun to explore interconnections between animism and actually Sufism in, in North Africa. And when the revolution broke out, I and others such as Ziad al Masafi and Samir Meres and others, we saw it as a Sufi spring. While it was carnivalesque, beyond this it had the feel of a, of a sacred festiveness, um, like that of a Sufi mulid. Um, many Egyptians who participated in the revolution testified to how it was somehow connected to the sacred um, for them. That, was an experiential observation on their part. And this was not in an institutional um, way. Um, uh, it, it was rather in a kind of joyful, freeing way. Um, people maintained that they got their souls back, meaning that they retrieved their spiritual dignity. This is what returned to them through the revolution. and. My argument is that if people got their souls back, this was from the leaders who were trying to immortalize themselves, um, the way they were clinging on to power um, individually or dynastically was a will to immortalize themselves. And I would say that this self immortalization is a matter of what Mamdani calls um, permanent majority status. Um, but it further concerns those who claim to be the possessors in chief of spiritual value and values. So this was important as to why people um, reclaimed their um, space um, also through expression of the sacred. Um, they were decolonizing the spiritual, you could say. Um, so while Arab leaders accordingly tried to treat themselves as essential, they treated their ordinary citizenry as inessential and easily replaceable people. And this is what the revolutionaries reversed or overturned. So the unwanted leaders became the inessential and replaceable. Um, and the emphasis on spiritual dignity that I speak of um, can be said to differ from pride movements in that the, the latter seek hegemonic recognition on the basis of identity. Whereas the dignity at stake um, I, that I, and that I explore in my book, it entails respect for the uniqueness of each being and is often actually expressed in terms of the soul rather than the ego. Um, okay, so what I want to say is that the Arab Spring, even as it has obviously been hijacked and contained forcibly, um, it, it hasn't been a complete failure since it did demonstrate that those who claim to represent the nation state are not its essential leaders, they could be and were removed. And also I think importantly as something that is an ongoing effect, the movement brought about a change in consciousness, this um, question of an Arab awakening. The way that Adaf Suef um, describes this awakening in her memoir of the Egyptian revolution is particularly pertinent um, for this presentation. She writes, and all these millions look like people who have woken from a spell. A man asks, how did they divide us? During the revolution, Egyptian people reconstituted society holistically in such a way as to um, 
defy the separation of identities. Copts and Muslims welcomed each other. The younger generations and the older generations welcomed each other. The middle classes, the workers, the unemployed welcomed each other. In Saleh's terms introduced earlier, the nation did become a demos again, as opposed to a genos. I mean, Mubarak called himself father of the nation and the people were not having anything of that. Um, they were not Mubarak's children. Similarly, in Lebanon, the ongoing uprisings have been, you know, very notably in defiance of sectarianism. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I would say that one of the important aspects of the uprisings is the way in which they demonstrated that the nation is not the same thing as the state. Um, in totalitarian situations, um, the equation of nation and state means that the people are not allowed their voices, they are always spoken for. And obviously the Arab revolutionaries got their voices back along with their souls and what have been very vocal and creative, expressive uprisings. Uh, and I would say this against the kind of biopolitics of neoliberalism that reduces the people to mute bodies. Ideologically, since it is often the feminine that is assigned the place of the mute, and you could say despirited body, so to speak, this explains the importance of the voices of women in breaking with the mystifications of such a positioning, while of course the freedom at stake is not limited to women. But I also want to explore the fact um, with some uncertainty and, and with a kind of curiosity in, in what you think is, is it that there is a way in which the non-denial of the feminine, feminine is important for the holism of the movements that we saw? I mean, one of the th things about the uprisings is that they entailed an immense sense of togetherness, overriding previous divisions. Um, but while this happened, interestingly, it did not erase the sense amongst revolutionaries of their individuality. In fact, one thing that I find revelatory is that the collective consciousness that emerged with the revolutionary movement actually served to heighten a sense of individuality as each revolutionary felt more truly and authentically themselves, um, able to act and express themselves in creative and spontaneous ways. Um, I'm referring to testimonies, testimonies that I quote in my book and I'm sorry I don't have the time to, to reproduce them, but um, one instance of this is um, engineer turned poet, Hatem Abdul Raza, um, as quoted by al Mamsi and Solomon, uh, remarks that the Egyptian revolution made a poet out of everyone. And um, in my analysis that I put forward, the reason for this sense of people feeling more themselves and less like the puppets of a system is that the forms of social interpolation altered. Um, so instead of seeking recognition in the hierarchical terms of the state and competing interest groups, the people were actually finding that they were able to acknowledge each other directly, spontaneously, to hail each other and welcome each other, as happened in the squares, regardless of state-sanctioned and patriarchal forms of uh, recognition. And I suppose it could be added that... Um, uh, state level recognition also pertains to the sort of bestowing of human rights from above. And they weren't sort of supplicating from human rights from above in the squares. Um, <clears throat> they just assumed that, that people had rights that were theirs, that they were born with, that they didn't have to supplicate for. Um, so earlier I spoke of how my work on animism and liberation struggles constituted uh, my pathway into the Arab revolutionary movement. And I wish to propose um, that in certain ways, indigenous ethics may arguably be of more relevance to understanding the Arab uprisings than certain forms um, of identity politics, <clears throat> especially obviously the commodified forms that don't break with the um, capitalist colonialist dialectic. Um, and one, one thing I want to draw attention to here in terms of this question of indigenous ethics is 
that um, a significant reason for this might be um, a distinction between the radical and revolutionary shared sense of the sacredness of life. Um, this came through in the uprisings, through the way in which um, the martyrs were received, especially, but there was a, an emphasis on the sacredness of life. And, um, and it's this that obviously extractivist capitalism lacks. Um, and I believe that what the far right tried to do to negate this loss of the sense of the sacred is to treat the nation state as if it were the sacred cause. And so the nation state becomes an idol to be worshiped. Mamdani argues modern colonialism and the modern state were born together with the creation of the nation state where the Spanish Castellinian monarchy ethnically cleansed Moors and Jews to create a homogenous nation. So we have therefore religious co-belonging being superseded by religious nationalism and eventually by nationalism as a kind of substitute religion. As certain intellectuals such as Durkheim have argued in favor of, and this is in contradistinction to Habermas's lifelong Kantian project on the public spheres necessarily distinct from the state. Lian Better Samasoke Simpson, an indigenous Nishabeng artist, states, indigenous nationhoods are not built upon enclosure borders, authoritarian power, violence, or even exclusive use. Indigenous nations are not a replication of the nation state. Um, in the context of colonialism, they are a generative refusal of the nation state system. She links this generative refusal to seeking alternatives that bring forth what she terms more life, where obviously it is life rather than the nation state that is seen as sacred. Um, what may be added is that while nationalism is very often promoted in terms of the right to self-determination, along with territorial possessiveness, this displaces the epistemic emphasis that I want to draw attention to an emphasis on co-arising rather than self-determination that indigenous philosophies variously put forward. I've studied African philosophies of Anhu and Ubuntu in this way. The emphasis is on this co-arising. Um, okay, so while identity politics crucially um, ad addresses questions of inequality and while it importantly tries to tackle violence against minorities and I have a great deal of respect for the critical race movement. Um, uh, where I'm trying to sort of take this is to the question that Simpson speaks of uh, in terms of generative alternatives because I believe that, that this is the challenge um, for the revolutionary side of things. Um, and um, so, so here, I suppose I've been trying to draw attention to the kind of holistic ethos of Arab Spring on a grassroots level, where the whole question that arises is whether um, the feminine and feminism is, is required for this holism. Okay, I should actually point out that there have been a number of critiques of... Um, identity politics that are very recent, including by Apaya, Fukuyama, Haider, and McGowan. Um, and I'm sorry not able to go into the various arguments of these works, which uh, are certainly worth engaging with. Um, but the problem that I need to sort of draw attention to is the question of whether the universal is defined in terms of Western Enlightenment um, epistemes and theoretical frameworks. And so here, what a study that um, particularly drew my attention is um, Massimiliano's insurgent universality, um, because um, he maintains that there is a particular alternative revolutionary universality. And he maintains that this is usually specifically mobilized by the poor, by women, and by indigenous communities. Um, and he sees this as emerging in um, 
contestation of the universal right to ownership of private property and in opposition to the Hegelian universality of a singular world history. Um, he, Tampa doesn't treat of the Arab uprisings, but there are many tangents between his study and my reading of the uprisings. And one thing I want to sort of point out is that he says that um, the insurgent universality he engages with has to, stereo, has to engage with stereotype notions of backwardness. Um, and so the revolutionary ins insurgents requires those who are forced to throw off being put into positions of backwardness, often women, um, often indigenous groups and so on. Um, and the importance of throwing off this backwardness is that the feminine um, emerges horizontally co-arising with the masculine. Um, okay, so finally, um, the revolution as a woman. Um, so Karl Marx observes that great social changes are impossible without the feminine ferment. And there have been many testimonies around us with respect to the Arab uprisings, um, that they were mobilizing the revolution, that their voices were once and for all heard. Um, Egyptian writer Saha El Mughi comments also that the revolution brought back what she calls the anima or feminine soul of the Egyptian people as a whole, which is a bit similar to the fem French feminist position um, is that um, feminism is not only for women, but for the sake of society as a whole. And I, I, one thing I just want to touch on is that one of the things that makes it difficult to convey this sort of revolutionary approach to the feminine um, is the shared epistemic framework of gender ideology and its seeming adversary of gender criticism, which can be a rather reductive framework um, when it is based on the notion that, that there is no reality to gender, but gender is something only constructed or scripted, um, where sex is the only biological reality. And I think that um, to a certain extent, certain transgender women and certain gender critical feminists both accept this as a framework, although they validate um, opposing sides of the binary as the locus of their truth, you know, gender performance for um, the transgendered women, uh, the biological body for the feminist essentialists. But the, the, the question I want to, re, re, um, to address here in the light of looking at sort of non-dualist animus philosophies is that this model um, of gender ideology is based on a very old mind-body dualism. The assumption being that our minds are separate from our bodies that the social script of gender informs the mind, leaving the body as a kind of mute material presence. Whereas the question is of the mind and the body not being separate from each other in this way, so that you might have a gender consciousness that is not um, simply conditioned by norms, social norms, of course, there is that conditioning, but it's not everything. Um, and there's also the question, um, and I can't really go into this at length, but in the question period, I could say more about it, is that certainly um, for some philosophies outside of the, the way spiritual philosophies I'm thinking of and religions, um, <clears throat> there's a way in which gender is a spiritual reality that gets put to one side. And, um, and it is a, a question of um, decolonial perspectives. Um, right. Uh, so the revolution is a woman is what the people on the streets um, of Lebanon have been chanting. Um, and similarly, the Sudanese revolution has been a feminine revolution with an estimate that 70% of the protesters were female. Allah Saleh is on the left of the screen becoming the icon of the front line. The Sudanese revolution has actually been dubbed the women's revolution for freedom, dignity and justice. Um, in Lebanon, while the revolution was sparked by the attacks on what's up, um, a number of women say that the environmental struggle was one of the factors that led to the outbreak of the revolution. Princess Zamani Bieni maintains that she was part of citizens concerned with environmental protests for two years that fed directly into the uprisings. Um, and finally, in Northeast Syria, the Kurdish liberation movement and Rojava has created a new interdisciplinary area of study, um, which 
considers not only the contribution of women to revolutions, but whether revolution itself is feminist and feminine. And they've called this new interdisciplinary area of study genealogy, uh, first formulated by Abdullah Ocalan in Freedom of Sociology. And um, it's devoted to how valuing femininity and the knowledge of women are bound with developing, bound up with developing democracies that are ethical, non-oppressive for everyone and environmentally responsible. So I'll um, yeah, draw attention to the fact that, um, that, that, there, that this movement is quite considerable actually, and it, there are even now um, university courses in the area of genealogy. And the idea is um, through understanding uh, women's knowledge, women's perspectives, and so forth. Um, this will ha have, as um, argued by the editor of Genealogy, uh, an impact on, on everything else in life. So that the feminine here, it relates to the holistic and, and how we see this. Um, so what I'm pointing to is that it's with this question of identity politics, we have to be careful not to also foreclose um, indigenous perspectives. You know, Mamdani is keen to undo the, the, the settler native um, duality, but I also think that we need to, um, on an epistemic level, um, preserve these kind of questions of holism and non-duality um, in relation to feminism and um, the feminine. So finally, I'll conclude. So while, while as discussed, the, the um, French intellectuals addressed, um, while they struggle to base universality on the nation state or on European civilization, a politicized identity that liberals see as secular and the right treat of in terms of race, they actually ignore how Arab left-wing revolutionaries are attempting to renew another approach to universality that can be seen to be premised on the demos against what Ocalan calls society side, the, the killing of society and on the ethical transmission of life. I will end this with a brief reflection. For some of us, both the Arab uprisings and the pandemic have been wake up calls in their very different ways um, and thus potential awakenings. The strange thing about viruses is that they actually have no life of their own and so depend on and claim the lives of other for their transmission. So it made me wonder if we could see capitalism and colonialism as partaking of this viral dynamic of destructive self-transmission. The Arab uprisings though have proved infectious in a totally different way because it is one that is creative, not destructive, exhibiting the dynamics of vital cooperation and reciprocal care. Um, and along with this, um, both the uprisings and the pandemic have led to the respective crises at stake being met with manifestations of solidarity necessarily. And I want to say that even if the solidarity isn't upheld by everyone as it isn't, it somehow pertains more to the universal than to how nation states claim self-righteous ownership of spiritual values um, in denial of the voices of the revolutionary feminist holistic movements drawn attention to. Okay, so I'll, I'll end there, but I'm very kind of curious to, to have your views on this question of the revolution is a woman and also of, of how different movements might connect up or are connecting up. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was so thought provoking and covering and the way you brought together so many different bodies of thought and so many different themes. That was uh, really impressive. Um, can I um, invite people to pose questions for Caroline? Um, so you can either raise your hand and um, and say your question. Um, I think you should be able to unmute yourself to do that. Or if you prefer, 
you can write your question in the chat. So uh, whilst maybe people are putting their thoughts together and, and formulating their questions, I'd, I would like to um, get a sneaky question in now as uh, one of the benefits of sharing this session. So, uh, as I said, I thought this was really, such a fascinating talk that brought together so many different, um, really like these crucial questions that we're, we're, we're dealing with in the current moment. Um, I just wondered what you thought about the idea of, um, well, so, my thoughts on the revolution as a woman, mm. um, I think that can mean so many different things depending on how the context in which um, that slogan is circulating and who's saying it. And, and it also has like, a, like it has different um, genealogies as well that you know so I'm thinking like gen you know like if you think about um Marxist thinking and um the way in which women's liberation was held up as a sort of marker of progress and and then even like within the Arab world I remember that if you um if you know uh the new uh the new woman foundation or used to be the new woman uh, mm -hmm. research center um obviously new woman that's taken from uh, the work of my brain's not working mm -hmm. properly today um yeah tahria amara is the book by um help me out somebody my brain has frozen anyway that you know Egyptian author from the sort of Nafta period and so you've got that sort of also those connotations between women as uh, a marker of progress in the context of the anti-colonial struggle um and and the and that 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 can be both mobilized in progressive ways, but it's simultaneously, it can also um, operate to reify some sort of civilizational hierarchies and um, essentializations. And then I think like in the more recent period, the way in which certain forms of feminism and women's rights have been mobilized in support of the war on terror and uh, the demonization of Muslim communities within Europe, for example, you know, that you know, somehow Muslims are all misogynists and uh, we need to survey them because they, you know, um, they, you know, the, they're violent and barbaric and the treatment of women is, is one example of that. So I guess it's like, I, I guess I'm bringing in some sort of more negative ways in which woman and gender and feminism um, can also uh, be mobilized in quite uh, reactionary and exclusionary ways. Thanks, Nicola. <laughs> um, I think that's very important and, and that's a very, very um, needed nuance. And one of the things that um, I had in, in mind was, um, Thinking back to um, liberation struggles in Africa, um, in both Zimbabwe and South Africa, um, women were praised endlessly by male comrades for um, all they were doing for the revolution and so on and so forth. And so, yes, there was um, a, a kind of almost kind of use of them in a way um, that became particularly problematic when um, the you know, independence came about and the, the goals of the struggle, you know, had been in a way met in, in terms of, um, yeah, um, there being independence. Um, 
And what became completely notable is that the women who'd been so praised and so um, active, actually, and they deserved all the praise they got, but they, they were um, no longer necessary. They were no longer needed. Um, and I thought, well, the, the, what, what interested me was the kind of move from um, women are, are kind of necessary comrades and uh, yeah, and, and we're so much at the vanguard because look look at our women and, and all of that. Um, but I kind of was thinking that the, perhaps particularly with the Rojava movement, because they say that by calling the word revolution is a woman, that they actually say, we're not trying to be essentialist about it. We're, we're, we're trying to use that. And this is why I think you're right to talk about the contextualization to say that the revolution isn't over. <laughs> so if we if we call the revolution a woman, it can't be bypassed by um, now we've changed power and now we're independent and you know so the woman can be left behind. Um, so it's a it's a way of saying don't forget what you haven't yet done for the woman. Um, and so I I think that 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 interested me about the way they were positioning um, things there. And I think that also sort of what interests me about that movement. Um, is the, the way in which they say that um, for them it's not, they don't see revolution as this question of a, um, power changing from whoever is leading the nation state. So it goes, it's a power change between leaders and you get a new set of leaders. Um, for them, the, the revolution is, is really about trying to create um, a different kind of society. Um, and it's sort of connected with the way in which, um, I suppose I, I, I was particularly close to the Egyptian uprising and how they were criticized, the revolutionaries were criticized for not wanting to seize power. But in a way that wasn't what they were saying it was about. Um, that would have been a kind of misreading of, of what they were, were wanting. And it was a different kind of revolutionary demand. Um, but, but I also want to say in response to your question is that one of the things that sort of worries me about identity politics is precisely how it's manipulated um, continually and all the time. Um, and, and I suppose the thing is that we, the, the difficulty is that we have to both kind of carry on with what we want to do, but also constantly re resist those manipulations. Um, and I noticed that particularly during the pandemic when the UK government was getting into enormous amount of trouble because um, it was being massively criticized for all the failings over how the pandemic was being um, you know, handled. And um, there was such a barrage of criticism. There was a sudden market shift in the media where we were suddenly being directed to um, battles between you know, um, woke, culture wars, you know, it was that kind of thing. And so all of a sudden they were, it was sort of, the Black Lives Movement got a huge amount of attention. And I thought, well, this is unusual. But at the same time, they were drumming up hostilities between them and the sort of white nationalists. And this was followed at the same time by a huge drumming up of antipathies between trans women and um, essentialist feminists. And they were drumming this all up in the media. and. I, I just kind of felt, I, I don't know how strategic it was, but it felt like they're using this to take the heat off <laughs> um, the government for all the criticisms that, that had been piling up. And it's true, people just stopped complaining about what was initially troubling them. So it's those sorts of manipulations um, that worry me and that seem to be ongoing around this. Yeah, indeed. All right, so we'll have a couple of people who've got their hands up. So shall I take these two questions together mm -hmm. so that um, you can have a little bit of a break? <laughs> and I should just also note that Hanen Natur very kindly reminded me that the author I was trying to think of was Kasim Amin. Oh, uh, yeah. So thanks, Hanen. <laughs> All right, so uh, Sandra Pagoda, I'll ask you first to, um, could you pose your question, please? Yeah, um, it's actually a sort of an extension of your question, Nicola. So thank you very much for a great talk. This was really supremely interesting. Um, I like this idea of the holistic revolution that you are um, thinking about. And I've been thinking about it myself. I think the um, 
what we're encountering at the moment is a situation in which revolutions cannot really make much progress because we basically have all these marginalized groups and we have power that has been cementing itself over such a long period of time in so many different ways. Um, it has more access to the very large coercive state apparatus. The connections with the internationals is very often um, counter-revolutionary as well. So we can see how power can stabilize itself and the, the movements in themselves that are trying to go against it are very often too marginal, too small to really do anything about it. But I've been wondering, um, in at least my own reflections about it, whether it is actually sort of um, really possible to make these kind of large coalitions that are needed in order to really do something about these power structures. Because if we think about, for example, the World Social Forum and places in which this has been tried, then don't we have to ask ourselves that if, you know, if we're looking for this common ground between very specific kind of demands coming from different types of movements, then what is the common ground that's in the end left and who has to make the compromises? And I think especially when it comes to women, then, you know, over the course of the history of revolutions, we have seen how women have been part of all of this. And as you said, afterwards, they have been systematically marginalized and almost all revolutions. So can this be avoided in such a large um, kind of coalition that's really needed for women? Thank you, Sandra. So uh, Tio, Teodora Todorova, would you like to like pose your question? Thank you. thank you, Nicola. And thank you, Caroline. Thank you very much. I'm from the University of Warwick. If we haven't met before, Caroline, I just want to say thank you so much for the incredible keynote. And in a way, my question leads directly from the way in which you finished your response to Nicola, but also in relation to Sandra's question as well. And particularly, I would like to ask you to reflect on the way you concluded your keynote, which was on the role of nationalism. And what I'm very interested in hearing from you is about the way in which there has been certain kind of manipulation as well as a highlighting of the role of women so there are lots of different ways in which the role of women can be seen in revolutions but what is quite interesting is to think about the way in which the revolutions have themselves very much evoked a nationalist ethos mm. and produce a set of in some instances quite problematic nationalism so for example thinking about the way in which the Egyptian revolution became associated with Arabness and what is going on in uh, Iraq and parts of Syria has become associated with, with Kurdishness and potential kind of exclusions of, of other minorities. So what I'm very much interested in, you may not have an answer to this, but what has been a feminist or feminist responses to, to this trend? Have there been responses from a, a feminine point of view in terms of partly in relation to what Sandra said, this idea of building a coalition that is is multi-ethnic, so has a more inclusive form of, of nationalism and more inclusive notion of what democracy means. And of course, that also has to do with the way women are actors as revolutionaries rather than just as representatives of the nation, because that is always the danger when women are evoked as part of the revolution. The revolution becomes a nationalist revolution and then the expectation is women are supposed to go home instead of be part of, of the new, new state or whatever the vision for, for the new uh, governance structure may be for you. So I'll be very much interested in hearing your reflections. And once again, thank you for a fantastic and thought-provoking keynote. Thanks, to you. Thanks, those are both um, great questions. Um, really sort of um, interestingly, challengingly. <laughs> um, so uh, well, I'll begin really with the question of, of nationalism. Um, and um, I suppose that the, the thing that is quite um, uh, alarming these days is the way in which nationalism is being used. <laughs> um, and that, uh, so yeah, I've looked a lot at discourses around um, extremism and um, so what the French are saying sort of echoes a bit what Netanyahu says in his book, and this is what rang some alarm bells for me, is that um, 
you know, it's up to sort of nation states to be the, the guardians of spiritual values that are being threatened by extremism. And this becomes actually potentially um, a, a kind of position where um, nationalism is being defended, but with, you know, spiritual and religious overtones that are, are really sort of um, feeding these far right movements. Um, and so, um, and it's because of the way in which nationalism as state nationalism is being used to uphold notions of the universality that are actually based in, in particular identities, obviously, um, that are being put forward as the majority. So in, in India, it would be the, you know, the Hindu nationalism and so forth. And it's, it's happening everywhere. Um, so in that sense, um, the, the question of um, not just letting um, these groups play um, identity groups off each other. It seems important that, and I suppose this is also going some way to addressing the first question that I was asked here as well, it, is that it becomes really important as to how we might um, configure um, connections um, between our constituencies that, that are going to resist that kind of we're the universal and you're just these, you know, minority groups and so forth. Um, but of course it's, it's, you know, fraught with difficulties and <laughs> difficulties of the past. And it, it's a kind of minefield that we have to negotiate. Um, and I have been trying to think a, a lot about this whole question of um, coalitions um, because um, I kind of, they're, they're coalitions that are set up and they're often for the advantage of one group you know, in spite of them supposedly being coalitions where the others are then co-opted into sort of supporting that. And, and so, the, so the question becomes, well, well what, what will make um, those kinds of connections more real? <laughs> um, I suppose I would use the term real. Um, and because I think that it does have to be that. I, I don't think that, that um, it works so well if you're just sort of playing it for political advantages. I actually, well, maybe I'm a bit um, utopian in this respect, but um, I, I suppose what interests me, for example, is that um, one of the ways I heard about the Rojava movement, um, first of all, was actually through Native Americans who were supporting it. And um, I thought, wow, that's amazing. Um, uh, uh, and they've been staunch supporters of of what's been happening in in that movement. Um, and um, so um, I thought, well, you know, it's kind of necessary to make those kinds of connections. And where where do we find them? Um, and um, they can often be, and sometimes quite usefully, sort of underground ones. We, in the previous session, there was questions of visibility is not necessarily always a good thing. Um, uh, but where, where we actually have these connections that are based on um, w intersections that are real, not just man manufactured. So I was thinking that, you know, there, there are obviously intersections between um, different groups interested in, in how, how to tackle environmental questions um, and who see this as having a connection with feminism and, and so forth. So it's, it's, I suppose it's keeping those conversations going um, and um, perhaps not thinking about how big the coalition will be, but um, how meaningful it might be. To, and to try and keep it meaningful is, I suppose, is, is how I'd approach that question. Thanks very much, Caroline. So, Heather, people are being shy. But if you don't want to speak your question out loud, you can write it in the chat. I, actually, I recently saw a film that um, just last week um, that sort of was touching on everything I was trying to address. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so maybe if I just, um, it might sort of make it more vivid because often a literary or a filmic work does. Um, so, yeah. so it was a film called Sherpa and um, it was made by a New Zealand director, um, 
Jennifer P. P. Would I think? I'm sorry if I've got her name wrong. But anyway, it's it's called Sherpa. It's up on Netflix at the moment, and it looks at um, the Sherpa community who help people climb Mount Everest, and um, and she was making this film at a, at a kind of traumatic time because what happened was 16 Sherpas lost their lives on Mount Everest as they were helping foreign tourists, uh, ex expeditionary people reach the top. And it was kind of interesting look at the community because on the one hand, it was very, very focused on the local. Um, it was this particular um, community of people who are acting as guides and basically as pack horses because what they do is they carry all the oxygen canisters and all the tents and and the people trying to who you know make it to the top of Mount Everest who are foreigners are not acclimatized and they can't actually do this stuff themselves so they need to both guide them through the difficult bits of the ascent um, which they know about, but also just literally act as these pack horses. And it's particularly dangerous for them because to keep the supply routes going, they have to go up and down the mountain through very dangerous routes. Um, and they get just paid a pittance for this. And so the film was beginning with their wives telling them, your lives are more important um, than the, the money you get. We, we can make the money another way. Um, and the men at first were reluctant saying, well, you know, it's, it's reasonable money and yes, it's a bit of risk, but they were being quite brave as it were. But then this, this tragedy happened and they thought, well, actually it's true. Our lives are more important than, you know, <laughs> just working for this company um, that by the way, charges 75,000 pounds for each um, person they get to the top. And meanwhile, these guys get just paid um, about 4,000 pounds for a season's work, you know, so, um, it's a huge discrepancy, and um, so, so when when this tragic um, accident happened, um, they decided we we want to cancel the season. We want to cancel the season out of respect for our dead comrades. Um, but also, they what emerged was that they were very upset with the foreign climbers' um, attitudes to the mountain because from they. Um, have animus Buddhist beliefs, and it's a, a holy mountain, a sacred mountain for them. And they thought that the way, um, you know, people were treating it, including, um, you know, they were using swear words like motherfuckers, and it's, it's the, the name of the mountain is Holy Mother. And they're saying, you don't use language like that on this mountain. And yet the climbers were refusing to, you know, um, do otherwise. And so there was already quite a lot of tension. But what was interesting is when they decided to go on strike and not, not carry through with the season, the, the um, New Zealand man who owned the, the kind of company that gets the explorers to the top of the mountain was furious with the Sherpa. And he said, um, and literally he used the most colonialist of language. It was quite shocking. He said, um, our Sherpa boys used to be so sweet and smiley. They never opened their mouths or had any demands our Sherpa boys. Now what's happened to our Sherpa boys? And he said, um, what's happened to them is that they found out about, and he said, the Arab summer. I mean, he didn't even get it right as the Arab spring. He says, and now that they've realized that there's an Arab summer, they think that, that, that they can be rebels. Um, and what was weird is that, you know, it was this um, whole kind of geopolitical horizon coming into this very sort of local scene. And all of a sudden they were being characterized as Arab revolutionaries. <laughs> um, and at the same time, among, there were a couple of American tourists who were being told, well, you're not going to be able to climb the mountain because the, the Sherpa people are on strike. And there were two who had totally different reactions. And I, I'm so glad for the second one because the, the first guy said, um, we have a name for these Sherpa people in our country. We call them terrorists. <laughs> you know, when people go on strike like that, um, it, it's, it's basically terrorism. But the other American guy was amazing because he said, there's no way I want to, to climb the mountain now that I know how they feel. And now that I've spoken to them, now that I've heard their voices, now that I've realized the, their kind of... Um, spiritual philosophy, their predicaments, what, you know, their, their women think. And it was such a, a different kind of reaction, but what, what, what was striking for me also was that the, the New Zealand guy who was um, trying to get the strikers to go back to work, 
he was playing classic divide and rule. He was saying, the Sherpas in the next village are really against you, you know. Um, <laughs> and they are trying to take your work away from you. And, you know, it was just, and that, but, but the, the director was very good because she actually interviewed various Sherpas and they said, it's not true, we're not divided. He's making that up. <laughs> And so, you know, all in one in this film, it was quite interesting because there they were positioned as revolutionaries. Um, uh, there there was this divide and rule. There they were being positioned as terrorists. Um, there there was this kind of difference of worldviews around the significance of the mountain. All, all these things came into play. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was kind of striking. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that. Uh, that sounds like a fascinating film. I'll definitely look out for that. I mean, that I think that's really um, when you said, you know, the way in which they the uh, they were accused of, or you know, like you said, oh, you know, we, we've got a word for that. We've got a term for that. Terrorists. I mean, it just reminded me as well of how, at least, you know, in the UK, the way in which um, ex extremism and and terrorism is just being um applied now to uh you know the extension rebellion you know um mm -hmm. environmentalists um black lives matter i mean yeah all of these movements that are challenging the status quo are now considered to be potentially uh extremist mm -hmm. terrorist organizations um and it really, it, it just shows how there's this sort of continual reproduction of this trope of, um, you know, to, to um, pathologize uh, the, you know, the resistance of, uh, of any group that mm. is uh, challenging the status quo, but I guess there are particularly also racialized dimensions mm. Um, to that as well. Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, the, the whole way in which the word radicalization has been used, yeah. um, it's very suspect because um, they, they keep trying to sort of ally any kind of left wing movement um, with extremism, which is um, obviously absurd. Um, and and that is to actually, I think, deflect from the extremism within the the kind of nationalism of the right. It's not we who the extremists; are, it's you who are, and we're constantly fighting that. Yeah. We have a question from the audience, uh, Philip Winkler. Philip, would you like to ask your question, please? Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes thank you. Um, thank you very much for the talk. First of all. Um, <laughs> My question kind of like takes up what uh, Theodora said and uh, probably takes it further because thank you very much for that uh, amazing story about the Sherpas being inspired by uh, the Arab Spring. <laughs> it's really interesting. <laughs> um, but taking on from there, I always wondered that isn't the concept of the nation in and of itself, like apart from the fact that many uh, aspects of it are highly problematic in general, also a hindrance to these international connections? Like, uh, and especially, um, you were mentioning Lebanon a few times. I was mm -hmm. wondering also in a debate about this uh, I attended last week, um, many of the uh, groups in these uprisings, we see that now in the protest movement, they are against sectarianism and against the exclusion of uh, certain groups that are marginalized. And very often they do so by referring to the nation, by saying we are one nation, we're all included in the nation. Well, Lebanon, ha I think around half of the people living in Lebanon right now are not Lebanese. They will be definitely excluded, even if not meant to be so, by saying we are referring to the nation as our uh, uh, political entity, like uh, the Syrians, for example. Um, so especially in countries like these, or to take the argument even further, think of a country like uh, the Emirates, where <laughs> any, where like uh, more than half of the people living there are not um, um, citizens are not part of what would be called the nation. So, uh, and also in Egypt, like the number is smaller, but still in Egypt, as far as I know, you have 5 million foreigners, mainly from uh, African countries, Sub-Saharan African countries, for example. And my question is, shouldn't especially these people, not just minorities that can be considered part of those who were always there, 
in the country you're talking about, for example, in Egypt or in Lebanon, but also migrants, especially in our days where there are hundreds of millions of migrants all around the world, shouldn't they also be always included in these uh, concepts? And isn't the ref reference to nationalism, whatever progressive or left-wing nationalism it may be, um, in and of itself, a huge hindrance to that? Thank you. Um, well, I think that's brilliant, actually. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, um, you know, actually, it's something that I've wondered about a lot. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer you because it's been a question for me. Um, because um, you know, um, I've worked in Lebanon and, you know, spoken to lots of people about the whole kind of sectarian situation. And so it was fantastic to see people form that kind of ribbon, you know, across the country from Tripoli to Tyre and everyone, as it were, coming together. And, but it's true, it, uh, the national flag is everywhere and it's, the, it's in the name of the nation. And I, and I do actually kind of myself wonder what that means, you know, in the terms that you were addressing, and um, I think that um, that the whole question of um, migrant workers and all of that is is crucially important. Um, I know people in Lebanon who are absolutely working on that question, um, but I I don't know how much debate there is about it. I mean, my my feeling is that the first thing that people are dealing with is there's been such a a legacy of sectarianism that that's the <laughs> the first thing um and that the, the other debates um around the migrant communities and so on um well they are being had i i know in some circles but not i don't think widely and I, and i do think it, it is the the crucial question that you're that you're raising there um I think it's it's very important. Um, although I think that the at the moment that the the emphasis been has been on the distinction between the state and the nation, and I and I think I, I think that the emphasis on the nation is precisely to say, but we have another huge collective that's not you, <laughs> um, as it were. It, it, that there's a it's a mobilization on on those grounds um, for the moment. Um, but, but the questions you raise, I, th I think, uh, will remain very pertinent. Hmm. I think when I'm, um, as I'm listening to this, I'm sort of recalling uh, Gaethje Spivak's, you know, notion of strategic essentialism and the, you know, the importance of both, you know, having, but, you know, the, the importance of essentialized identities of some sort as a sort of subject position from which to uh, maybe mobilize and make collective demands, but also the danger of any sort of um, identity then becoming uh, essentialized and and uh, and and I guess that would also you know link to you know these problems of whether to create I mean how to uh, uh, what's the basis on which to create some sort of collective identity and and the dangers of creating any identity that then, you know, there's an attempt to sort of solidify that as somehow the only or authentic identity. Yeah, and I think that there's also been a response to, um, one of the things that sort of interests me is that um, what happens with um, nations that are, become post-colonial, but don't, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I mean, once they feel that they've been through that, phase um, is that the, the the liberation struggle is often con colonized by the elites um, mm. of the nation who start to think they own it and represent it and are it and so I think there is that that thing of retrieval um, you th you think you are the voice of the nation but you're not <laughs> um, and yeah I mean I think that you know someone like Robert Mugabe, Gaddafi, I think both Assads were were as it were commodifying and claiming and owning liberation struggles as if they were one and the same with it um, and they were the national struggle and so it's this pulling the nation back to the people um, mm. I, I think is an important part of it. Mm. Yeah that, that was very much with make me think of Fanon, Franz Fanon's arguments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a question in the chat. 
um, it, it may be a bit beyond what you were speaking about uh, today, Caroline, but somebody, uh, so Arwa Badran is asking about women's resistance within academia um, uh, in, in the Arab region. Um, just both, you know, I guess there's also a question around knowledge production. I mean, we could perhaps link that to, you know, what sort of knowledge production is coming out of the Arab region itself, maybe on some of these questions that you've been discussing today, Caroline. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, th I think it's very important for us to hear um, from Arab women. It's, it's uh, kind of obvious, but it really is important because to be honest, I'm, I'm tired of reading accounts of these things where no one quotes a single voice of relevance. Um, I know that the interviews are an important part of your work. I think it's crucial. Um, I think all kinds of conversations are absolutely necessary. And the way I see my role within academia is actually to try and find those voices and make get them heard. You know, I, I was putting a lot of emphasis on the voice because um, a lot of emphasis has been put on revolutionaries as bodies, but I, I kind of feel and one of the reasons I was going over the terrain of new French feminism is that, that we have to um, address the fact that, um, you know, neoliberalism makes a lot of um, biopolitics where people are positioned as mute vulnerable bodies. Um, and th there needs to be so much emphasis on the voice and on the voices of women. <laughs> um, so um, I think it's, it, it's crucially important um, on all levels. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've been, um, I've been finding the current situation of not traveling frustrating because <laughs> I feel I'm sort of um, hopelessly disconnected. I need to somehow be having those conversations that would, would reconnect me. Um, and um, so um, I'd, I'd love to actually hear from the questioner, um, you know, what, what, what she had, was thinking about there and if there were any particular strands of thoughts or, um, or figures that, you know, she would like to, to mention or draw attention to. Although we have Ardwa, would you like to? Yes, hi. Question. Hi. Um, yes, thank you very much for the keynote uh, speech. It's um, I'm I'm particularly interested in how little there is in terms of engagement in academia, but in kind of the the discourse, it seems to be. Um, um, you know, there seems to be, as you said, an absence in in, in women's voices. Um, so, so those resistance uh, movements have come into the revolutions, for example, on the streets that you see them. You know, and um, you know, and they have a particular impact, uh, perhaps um, momentarily, but it's a different field when it comes into writing, not necessarily in academia, but also in in any kind of a pub publication form. Mm. I just wondered, like the absence has been also going on for longer than that. So if you go back to the you know forties and fifties and sixties, a lot of the thinkers um, that came up with, with revolutionary ideas were male um, from from the Arab region. So just thinking about the kind of the new generation, whether there is a change in that, and whether what you think about the future of women's voices within that kind of not on the street, but in, 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 in the words that, that are, um, mm. that get, yeah, that get published. Well, I, I suppose my field is, is mainly literature and culture and popular culture. So, um, you know, where, where I'm attending to voices, it's of writers on the whole, personally, but obviously also, you know, um, colleagues in, in universities and, and so forth. Um, you know, I can think of names of people whose work is, is important for me and whose work I quote and use and, and so forth. But I absolutely agree that there needs to be a whole lot more um, because, you know, when I was trying to do some research on the Rojava movement, there was so actually little being published by women. And it was feeling totally frustrating because I was thinking, here's this amazing movement. They're doing all sorts of interesting things on the ground and, you know, and 
um, when I was trying to find out about who was writing about it, it was male, male writers. And I was thinking, no, you know, <laughs> this can't be right. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted. I, I found out this um, very weekend that Haven Gusena, um, a, a woman from the movement has just produced a book that has been translated and that especially is, is great. And I think, fantastic. Um, and I'm so excited. I mean, I'm really excited. And um, I, I think that there needs to be more translated, more in circulation and um, more connections that we make, especially when we can hopefully travel again, because it's, it's always better when we're together in a room. But if not, that, that we have um, more chances of talking together. But I also think that we get to know, um, I actually think that we need to get to know um, <clears throat> intellectuals in um, universities all over the Middle East, quite frankly, <laughs> um, because th there is so much sort of attention that is given to American or American-based academics, um, I find. Um, and um, I suppose I kind of wonder how the, the way in which we look to, to certain institutions or, or places um, around this is something that does intrigue me. Um, because, you know, I was talking about how, um, you know, Said and, and Spivak came to study Western stuff here. And I, I have lots of, you know, students applying to do PhDs. And um, it's always the question of who, who you know, why, why come and work here? And, and what um, intellectuals do you want to engage with? Um, and um, I have to say that sometimes um, there is a certain assumption that, it, that if you're approaching a kind of, say a UK institution, it's it's somehow more universal. <laughs> Ideologically, there's a myth around it or, um, and and I mean, I myself even had that because I was, you know, grew up in a, in a colony. And I always thought when I came to England, I would suddenly have this access to a kind of worldly universality. And I felt disappointed that I didn't really get that feeling, you know, um, and, um, and yet, um, you know, there were just as interesting people in the universities in the country I came from, but who never got heard of. Um, and so, so yes, it's it's something that definitely needs to be addressed and worked on. Thank you. Yeah. All, right. All right. So I think that um, we need to bring this session to a close because it's almost three o'clock. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a couple of questions still in the chat, which are excellent questions, but I would like to encourage Nermeen and Taysir to um, bring those questions with you to some of our other keynote plenary sessions this week. So uh, tomorrow, um, I'd like to highlight that at 3.15, we have a plenary panel uh, roundtable discussion on disrupting, refusing and transgressing knowledge production in Middle East studies. And I think that um, Taysir's question would fit really well into that panel. And then on Wednesday at 10 a.m. we have Amina Wadud speaking on Islamic feminism, what's in a name? And um, I'd like to suggest that Nagamine's question would be a really great question for that uh, speaker. Um, I also want to highlight that on Thursday at 1 p.m. there's a graduate student section event. So um, anybody who's a, a member of um, or who is a graduate student, uh, a member of a, student, a graduate student section or is, or is just a graduate student is very welcome in that event, which is on writing within and beyond academia. And then on Friday at 3.15, we have um, which is the final day of the conference. We have Pinar Bilgin, who'll be speaking on Nowhere to Run, Decolonizing the Study of the Middle East Between Area Studies and International Relations. So in addition to that, we have still many, many uh, exciting and, um, and, and thought-provoking panels and roundtables this week. Um, so I hope that you're all going to have a chance to attend some of those. But it remains for me then just to say 
uh, thank you so much, Professor Caroline Rooney, for this amazing uh, keynote talk. Um, I think so many people have been, uh, have so many questions afterwards that they're probably still formulating them. I'm sure this is gonna, this keynote will be a great subject of discussion, I think, for many people in the coming weeks. So thanks so much for that. And um, I would like to invite everybody in the audience, although um, we can't hear the applause, um, maybe you can all uh, click the reactions uh, buttons so that we we give Caroline a <laughs> big round of applause. Right, thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you all, thank you all. <laughs> right, so I wish you a good rest of the week. Um, to everybody and especially to Caroline. Um, take care, everybody. Bye.